this event on October 7th, this, this, this horrible thing that happened on October 7th, that this was emails from every institution, every business, every single person, every politician, everybody. But the subsequent October 7th that happened every single day since have had, have received zero acknowledgement. Welcome to another episode of Yellow Let's Talk, the podcast that is going to help you figure things out. Today, we want to talk about a very important topic, and it's really unpacking the trauma that's happening around the world, specifically with Gaza. We can't have a conversation about Palestine without having a conversation about about the mental health, about the mental health crisis, about the well-being, about trauma, about activism bur- burnout, and so. So today we have with us. Dr. Net. So Dr. Net now is a Syrian Canadian psychiatry resident here in Canada. She has been an advocate for Palestinian liberation and has spoken on topics from Palestinian trauma to survivors. Game. Thank you so much, Dr. Net, for being with us today. Thanks for having me. Excited. Yeah. I and mean, hopefully this episode is going to help a lot of people cope with what's happening and at least give a better understanding of uh, of what's happening from a mental well-being perspective. Yeah. In 2005, there was a study in world psychiatry about traumatized children. And this is in 2005. It was discovered that Gaza children were the most traumatized in the world. We know that the Gaza children face a lot of trauma. And I just wanted to ask, in your professional opinion, what does trauma look like for children in Gaza? They have this physical appearance of uh, of immobility um, and and paralysis. Sometimes these children that you'll see might be shaking. Um, they might be doing that immediately after a bombardment, but they might also be sitting in a, in a, in, a, in an hospital bed, have drool from their mouth, not being able to eat or sleep, not responding to people. So it's not even engaging with you when you talk to them. Um, sometimes your limbs might actually go numb and, and blue and cold because of lack of blood flow because you're in one position for so long. So that's when observed in a lot of, a lot of kids. Seizures even, like the, I can't even explain the mechanism to be honest, but so many of these kids are requiring um, these either prophylactic, so prevention of, the, of seizures or treatment for seizures. Um, and then you might see, you know, the more traditional classic way of responding to trauma. So somebody uh, completely withdrawing, like just not, not, no longer engaging with their family or engaging with their, their friends or engaging with anything like they used to do before this very traumatic experience happened. So that withdrawal, that numbness, that just disconnection from like, from your body and, and the world, like you're present, but you're not really present. Like your mind isn't any. Um, and we, we can like, there's so many different names for that, but um, it's like derealization or depersonalization. So feeling like the world isn't real or you're not real. It's interesting uh, that you mentioned all of these terms, because when people think of trauma, when they think of uh, the children in Gaza, they're thinking, okay, they're anxious. They might feel humiliated. Uh, they might feel, and when I say the word humiliated, it's just, uh, just for context is that there are reports that the children in Gaza do feel humiliation and so do their children, uh, do their parents because they don't feel like they're safe. Uh, but when you put it in the context of there's actual uh, mental illness that's being associated with this trauma, it really just shows you the severity of what's happening. And it's not, so there's deaths. Right now we are, um, we're three months in and we see uh, over 30,000 people die, but we also are now seeing how the world has filled our children. And I just wanted to dive into how that trauma then manifests into adulthood. Mm-hmm. How does trauma in Gaza and children manifest into how they become as adults? I think that would be uh, it's similar to you know anyone who kind of experienced trauma, except for the fact that they are not safe. So the only difference is that, yes, okay, these kids are going to grow up and become adults, but are they safe? Are they still in Gaza? And if they are, then no, they're not. The answer is no. So they don't, I guess, I don't, like, I'm not, not to be offensive to anyone who experiences PTSD, but they don't get the privilege of PTSD. They don't get the privilege of a post-traumatic stress disorder because they're in the trauma for their entire lives. These are generations that live born in Gaza, die in Gaza, right? Like, 
they live there their whole lives and they're besieged. So majority of them can never leave, even if they wanted to. So traditionally, yeah, you would develop a post-traumatic stress disorder. You develop the nightmares and the hypervisions, which is like this extreme hyperreactivity to very benign stimulus, like something that typically would never make a person shape or, or fearful. You might, uh, you might have um, like adults who, for example, leave traumatic situations. So even like Palestinians and people who lived in Gaza who leave Gaza, they'll tell you like they might smell something that they could remember from a, from a prison cell. Oh. And that, that throws them off for the rest of the day. Like that's not even the day that probably lost much longer. That's PTSD. Um, the nightmares at night that are incontrollable, they're inconsolable. They wake up and it's so real. It's so vivid. It, that's PTSD. But again, it's sort of a privilege because your body for you to develop that kind of a response does need a level of safety first. What do people in Gaza develop? I think they're always surviving. They're always still trying to survive. They're always still under the trauma. So do they develop PTSD? Traditionally, not. It looks very different for them. And I don't think we have the science necessarily at this time to label that. Um, there is a, an amazing psychiatrist in, in, in Palestine in the West Bank, uh, Dr. Samah. And she does a lot of this like work about children who live under persistent trauma. And she said locally, like, we don't, we don't have a PTSD here. It never is. Um, so what it looks like for them is probably a combination of all of these symptoms of still being acutely traumatized and having that post trauma from like not being bombarded, but still being starved of not being, you know, of not being homeless, but still besieged, you know, still waiting for that next aid truck. Like it, it, it's just such a mix of gold. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, I never thought about PTSD and again, being passionate with anyone who does experience that as a privilege yeah this the children in gaza or people in gaza don't have a privilege. they're still living in it right now uh, and it is it is something that it, it's scary to try to comprehend at the same time you identify that there's no science even to label that at the at the moment not really like other than these very amazing you know positions coming yeah. from the ground that are like okay we'll spearhead this because no one else will and if you think about all the psychiatric diagnoses as well, a lot of them were based on veterans coming from war, veterans primarily from these Western nations, right, that had gone to other nations to fight wars. So we're not even studying the other. Yeah. We're studying the West. So they're coming from a very biased lens that, that again, is not a privilege to, that, that is not a, a privilege afforded to everybody. Um, so I, I don't see the same studies being done in Vietnam, but the veterans from there have been studied quite extensively, right? And these diagnoses come from uh, a lot of these studies from from, the, from particularly white men. Uh, and there's obviously so much research on other diagnoses, but with respect to trauma, I mean. And you brought up an excellent point. Even the studies, they're not, they don't have the cultural lens that we may need to understand what's even happening in Gaza. So we've talked about now about the trauma that people in Gaza, specifically the children in Gaza, and I want to take this conversation to talk about vicarious trauma. And we're seeing all these atrocities unfold. We're seeing it on our social media. We're seeing it in the news. How does vicarious trauma impact us? Is it even a thing? It's definitely a thing. I can say that for certain. It's definitely a thing. I see it in my friends. I see it in my family. I see it in myself. Right? We all experience um, some level of vicarious trauma from witnessing and consuming. Um, I hate to say the word consuming because it's such it's so sad, but it's a form of consumption now that it's it's content that they're you know that people in Palestine and Gaza feel the need to put out for us to hear them and see them and bear witness to what they're experiencing. But yeah, it, it, it's very it's a very legitimate form of trauma. Um, I, I don't know how legitimate it is in terms of like a diagnosis, but I, I personally would say that it is very legitimate. What it looks like is kind of a lot of things, like even similarly difficulty sleeping, right? Um, difficulties with having these vivid sort of nightmares or dreams based on what you were see seeing on your social media, the videos, the, the, the content that you were seeing. You know, some people will feel like they're there. Like they'll, they'll describe, um, like, oh, I, I had a dream that I was there or that I was being bombed or that I was being shelled or sniped. And they may not be Palestinian. They might not even be affiliated with the region at all, but it's so vivid to them because that's all they're consuming all day, every day. 
I'm not saying that it's negative to consume that stuff. I get that we are in a time where right now I really feel like it's the bare minimum we can do is consume and bear witness and, and all of that. So people have difficulty sleeping. They have that feeling of I'm there. It's happening to me. They have feelings of disconnection again. So it's like you're living on autopilot. Mm -hmm. You know, that feeling where, you know, you're driving home and you're like, how did I just get home? I don't even remember this like 10 minute drive because you're so familiar with that drive from work to home or from that drive from, I don't know, if you, if you go to like your gas station or whatever it is, that's constant. It's a constant state of like, how did I get here? Did I put that down? Did I remember that thing? Or did I did I talk to that person? Like, you're so not present. You forget what you were doing. You forget where you were in the moments of the day. And then it's day after day after day. And that level of disconnection can get pretty bad. Like, that level of forgetfulness. I mean, it's it, it's um, it can be so bad that you forget serious things, right? Or you don't remember serious things. Or you're not present with children, for example. So your kids and your family. Um, and then even disconnected from your job, still so like your performance at work, your capacity to your job. I hear it's trauma is very real. And it's interesting you mentioned all these signs that happen or all these uh, symptoms that you get from vicarious trauma. But for anyone who's listening who is experiencing these things, what advice would you give them to cope with vicarious trauma? That's a really good question. It is because, like, how am I supposed to tell somebody? I mean, technically, the solution to this is that you sh people shouldn't be getting bombed yeah. and have their homes destroyed and have and, and be starved to death and be so dehumanized constantly by our politicians, by our media. Like, I, I wish that I could snap my finger and say, OK, hey, you know, you no longer have to experience this trauma like it's gone now. So you're good. But that is truly the solution. Like that truly is what we need. We're, none of, all of us would not be in such a state of like this like communal turmoil. For all, I feel like there's so many of us that are just like, it's, it's so heavy all the time. Um, but if, if we can stop it, even though we, we do everything we can to continue stopping it, we still advocate to stop it. Um, you know, there's always recommendations for talking to somebody. So having your own therapist, if you can have one or you can access one, if you can't, there's like community building. So having a place where you can go, where you can have people that are safe for you, that are not going to make it worse. Right. Cause we all know if we can go, if we go to our colleagues or our schools or, you know, our, our um, institutions, we might not feel supported. They might actually yeah. gaslight us. Right. Or they might actually, um, be you know, pro a literal genocide currently or, or for the, um, you know, the annihilation of an entire people. Like the, a lot of people in positions of power have those beliefs and thoughts. So going somewhere safe, having community, therapy, somewhere to like release those emotions, talk it out, process it. Um, there is, you know, that things to be said about uh, making sure that you even do the basic things. So I remember in 2021, I did a post about this where I, I didn't realize how impactful it was because it was so simple to me when I made it. I thought it was so simple, but everyone was like, oh my God, like this was so helpful. But just the idea of like literally making sure you sleep, like forcing yourself to go to sleep. You can't do a scroll all night. It will not liberate anyone. Like let's be honest, uh, making sure that you drink water, that you take your, you know, your deep breaths every single day, that you're mindful and have a practice of grounding every day, that you're in the present moment every day. Um, but those practices need to, you know, need to be practiced kind of regularly for them to have an impact. If it's not going to change overnight. So making sure that you do those things. And I'm glad you mentioned that because a lot of people who are going to be listening to this are going to go, like, okay, I'm, I'm feeling this vicarious problem, or it could be activism burnout. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit, but we're like, okay, what do I do? And you're right. The solution is we need to stop the genocide and we need to start putting more pressure on our government to, to stop what's happening. But until that happens, what can we do? And a lot of the things you were mentioning is finding a safe space finding community, finding someone to talk to. Therapy is uh, is huge. And I really do hope whoever is listening is to, to show, take the initiative to put their self as well. Uh, I don't want to say put yourself first, but also to have that self-care. I guess that's the right word as opposed to put yourself first. Yeah. There is a post by the holistic psychologist. And I want to mention this yeah. post because I think, so... The holistic psychologist, I have so much respect for her. It's actually one of my favorite pages. 
And the post itself was talking about disconnecting. So it's about disconnecting from social media because as humans, we're not used to seeing all this that's happening and all these atrocities. And now with social media, we're seeing it and we're awake and we're, our nervous system is not reacting. And I'm just going to read a little bit about that post. So the post was about how our nervous systems didn't evolve to hear everything that is happening in every area of the world. And so in one of her slides, she writes, just as it's important to be connected and know what's going on in the world, it's equally important to be disconnected and to be in stillness with friends and in peace. We cannot change anything around us if we are dysregulated and unable to cope. So there was a lot of backlash from the uh, community in the comment section saying that it is a privilege to be able to disconnect. And I want to know your thoughts and what advice you would give someone if they are trying to balance between their own well-being as well as their activism and their advocacy for change when it comes to Palestine. So I want to start off by saying I, I personally do not. Uh, I'm not a fan of that particular page. Uh, I do not align with that page in, in any way. Um, I don't share any common values with that page. And I say that because I've already, like, I'm very vocal about about that and about my uh, kind of opinions about certain um mental health pages and platforms and the re the reason is is it's because of its connection to a very white supremacist way of approaching healthcare and approaching mental health and a very individualistic and not just individualistic individualistic but like it's almost like it's um the individualism is it trumps any community like in, you can be in in some ways a little bit you know self preserving. You want to preserve yourself and your capacities, which is kind of what you're talking about, um, but not at the expense of the greater good. And I genuinely believe that that page is is does not align with that particular second part that I just mentioned. So I want to make that disclaimer. Um, I purposely didn't comment on your longer posts or on that post because. I have a lot of, like, it's not unusual to see that coming from that page. It's not unusual to see that coming from a lot of pages, not even just hers. It's very, very common to observe very, um, you know, very Western, uh, hyper-individualized, kind of white-centered pages share that kind of content where it's like, oh, yeah, for the weekend, make sure that you just connect from your phone and wherever you're like, my people are dying. Like this weekend is not the weekend that I'm going to disconnect. No, no weekend is a weekend that I can disconnect. My people are dying. They're dying every day. They're dying on weekends. They're dying on weekdays. I don't go out and party to celebrate anything because my people are dying. And whether or not it was my people, I don't think that I would feel any less angry and furious and frustrated, including about, you know, what's happening in Sudan and what's happening in Chicago. Those are my people. This like this is a community where a global world like these are also humans that deserve our rage and our advocacy. And for us not to like look away, it's insulting. Honestly, it's insulting, frankly, to be like, yeah, don't worry, just like we'll have a good weekend. Disconnecting in terms of having a break from all of that consumption and and being in the community and having that stillness. Absolutely, I think those are things that are important. The overall message of that post does not indicate to me that there is any sense of, of, of community of like, I'm, I'm still responsible for other lives on this earth. And my privilege, just like the privilege of the people who created that post makes me powerful to fight for those people. So why would I throw that away and, and pretend that I'm somehow powerless while simultaneously being like, well, I actually, you know, I'm going to just spend my weekend doing something fun. That, that is such a, like, it's insulting, and I think it's irresponsible. You have so much privilege. You have so much power. Because you can do that on the weekend, it means you do. It's evidence that you do, is what I'm trying to say. The fact that you can disconnect and close your phone and do whatever it is that you're doing and be safe and enjoy your time indicates that you have the power and privilege to enact change. Use it wisely. And I think it's, such, it's so dangerous to even make comments and, and posts like that. Even if you put a million disclaimers, you could have posted about so many other things. Mm -hmm. You could have used that one, you know, that one post with all of that engagement and all of that range farming, essentially. I think that's what a lot of these, these accounts do is like cause all this rage and that they get all this attention. You could have posted a video. You could have posted Palestine's video. You could have shared the fact that Hind, a, a girl that's six years old in a car, was found dead today. You could have done so much with the probably 3 million people that witnessed that one post on your page. 
And that's what you chose to do. I think it's irresponsible. Well, and I appreciate your opinion on that and your input. It's, and just to make it more, not necessarily about the page, because, you know, this was content that someone put out there, but just more about the question of what can we do? Because there is this, there is this uh, struggle right now between like, hey, how can I take better care of my myself if I'm constantly seeing all of this? And it obviously affects different people. So my question to you as a psychiatrist is that what advice would you give to someone like that if they, they're like, you know what, I am privileged. I am, I do feel a survivor still. And I'm really struggling right now. Yeah. And I want my people to be free. I want my people to not be dead. On social media, should we disconnect on social media from time to time to preserve our mental well being? I think that's a, it really depends, right? It really depends on the person. Um, of course, if, if it's, if, if it's becoming so compulsive that you cannot put it down or put it away or function, absolutely you should. That is what I would recommend somebody if they came to me and I, and I observed that. Um, I, I, I don't know if, uh, like it's such an arbitrary question because it's like, how long do you disconnect? Like how long are you, are you away for three months <laughs> during a three month genocide? Um, it's very arbitrary. I, I really don't know. I was hoping you'd say, no, do not disconnect. Keep going. Keep spending. Keep consuming the content. Keep staying angry. Keep advocating. If I was talking to my friend, hundred percent, I would be like, yes. And I and but when I say that to my friend, and I say that to her, and I invite her over to my house, and I and we we cook together, and we have coffee, we go out for drawings, we go to events together. So I'm holding her down while she's doing that. I'm making sure that. Yes, I'm going to tell you, don't stop posting, stay angry, be angry. I'm going to be angry with you, but I'm supporting her with it. Like we're, we're in it together. If I'm going to be professional and talking to a, uh, you know, to a larger audience or to a person, I can't do that for everybody. Sorry. My advice has to be so professional. That has to be like, yes, depending on who the person is, of course, there's people that have been underlying mental illnesses that go into this and it's paralyzing. It exacerbates their, their, their uh, symptoms. I have to have to advise them accordingly, but of course they say as people. Okay, good, good. Let's. If I, if I, if I, if I, if I I'm perpetually angry. No, I understand, and I think this the whole point of this episode is really to find ways of hoping and understanding and knowing that there is a whole community that shares those uh, feelings and emotions and rage and distress. Um, you know, you put it perfectly. Like our people are dying, and this is not the time to just fully disconnect and be like, well, you know, this is not what I want to see right now. It's see it and use your privilege to act upon it, to advocate for it. Um, so I want to talk about activism because you touched a lot on that. And I want to know more about right now for advocating. We are going to these protests. We're posting on social media. Sometimes we burn out. And I want to know what are the signs of activism burnout? And maybe you can define what activism burnout in the beginning, and then what are the signs of activism burnout? Activism burnout is just like similar to what your typical burnout would be. So it's usually defined by like your job. So when you're burnt out at work, uh, it's sort of like that. I don't like this word, but it's like that absenteeism. So you're at work, but you're really not at work. You're so disconnected from everything. Um, that's a major sign of burnout. It's like, you're just going through the motions. Like I was describing that, you know, that idea of like, I got home, but I don't know how I got home, but it's chronic. It's all day, every day for days. Um, it's very, it's a very bizarre, it's hard to even explain. If you've if you, if you just, if you've been through it, you can like understand what it feels like, but it's hard to describe that feeling of disconnection. Um, and it's so lo uh, prolonged. Um, you forget things like you're so forgetful when you're burnt out because your mind cannot contain information. It cannot hold information in. You're just not able to even recall conversations or things that you had to do. Your mind is overwhelmed. It's like it's jam packed. It can't fit more. Um, you might be sleeping too much, sleeping too little. So either one really can be burnt out. Um, and otherwise, you know, there's, there's, some symptoms that kind of overlap with other things, but you know, your mood is really low or you feel very down. 
Um, and uh, even like your function. So for example, like your capacity to just like wake up in the morning and brush your teeth mm -hmm. an hour, that becomes the heaviest burden in the world. Just getting up in the morning and the air bed and showering. I say that because it can overlap with depression. So I want to be cautious about that. So if you have that, it could also be more of a depression, but yeah, those are all nothing. That go out. So you couldn't uh, you try to summarize this. So number one is you're sleeping a lot. Yes. Number two, you are a little agitated. Would that be a one? You could be at irritable. Oh yeah, irritable. very low temper, very irritable. S and burn off that. And now, would that advice change in terms of coping for activism burnout uh, versus just in general? Like, is it still going to be the same as in? Hey, go to a therapist, or is there something you would recommend uh, to cope with activism burnout? I think on top of that, for activism burnout uniquely, because I think a lot of us are maybe in like message groups or advocacy groups. I'll speak like for myself, like I'm in so many advocacy groups, or and I have to draw such clear boundaries. So uniquely for that, I would say, when people ask you for things, you really have to draw a line. So if you keep getting asked for, for a favor or for this participation or this event or this whatever, draw your line. Like you can't be everywhere all the time. Um, and advocacy is important, but just like don't don't pour constantly out of, a, out of a cup that you know is going to become empty. Keep a little bit. You need to keep it. You need to keep some in your cup just to just to stay alone, just to stay to survive. So I would say keep good boundaries. Um, there's people that I know in the groups that are always like, you know, I, I'm not very active and I'll read the messages every few days, but like I'm here and message me if you need something. So even like just that boundary of like, I can't read every message. I can't sign every petition or I would like to sign every petition. Make sure you send it to me so I can sign it, but I can't read everything or participate in everything. Um, so just draw your boundaries very clearly. I think that would be something additional. I love it. You said that, uh, I remember there's a quote by, uh, Dr. Mate. Gabriel Mate, and he says, when it comes to compassion, compassion fatigue, it's, there's no shortage of us as humans having compassion, but it's really the shortage comes from having compassion and empathy within ourselves. And one of the ways we can have empathy and compassion within ourselves is putting these boundaries. And you echoed that very, very eloquently. So thank you very much, Dr. Nanda, for putting that, for putting it that way, because you're right, you can't. You can't continue advocating if you're everywhere. That's burner. Yeah. Uh, so pick the right spots, but continue to advocate. Yeah. We all yeah. have a role. All of us have a role. And all of us have, and every single thing that you do do is super valuable. And I remember that being something I mentioned in the advocacy post because we might think like, oh man, I'm not doing like what that person is doing. I'm not enough. Like I'm, 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 I'm not good enough or I'm not doing enough or I'm useless. And it's like, no, you like if you look back, like you went to that protest and you sign every petition and are on these email threads and you posting, you're posting every day, like, come on, like give yourself credit too. And don't compare yourself to all the other people. We all have, and that person might not be doing it. So keep that in mind that everything you do matters. I love that. Everything that you do matters. Thank you for putting it that way. And I hope whoever is listening, if you are doing things and if you are advocating to take a moment and just commend yourself for for doing what you're doing, for standing for what you're standing. And uh, so thank you for putting that. Uh, so I want to go into the next part of our conversation. And I want to talk a little bit more about this concept of cognitive dissonance and how after October 7th, the world has woken up. And we see, before October 7th, we see the, the narrative that we grew up with, which is arrows. Palestinians are seen as terrorists. They're seen as this evil, barbaric narrative. And little do we ever see that the narrative of, of them being oppressed, of them living under an occupation, of them having families. And there's this one incident that broke what Hollywood and what centuries of media, or not centuries, but of years of media have tried to basically cultivate up the Arab man. And I'm, it's the, the, the Arab or the Palestinian grandfather holding his passed away granddaughter and saying, look, bro, just a soul of my son. And I want to go now to just ask them from your opinion, how has the world 
woken up since the events of October 7th, seeing these atrocities unfold in Gaza. So to address the the one point you mentioned initially about us never being allowed to be oppressed, right? It's always this idea that we are perpetrators of something mm -hmm. and that the world responds to whatever claim or accusation of something that was perpetrated by um, Arabs and Muslims, unless it serves the narrative. So unless it serves them, we're never oppressed and we're always we're always doing something bad. And the way that it serves them is to label them as oppressed, right? That's the way that they always love to frame it is oh, women are just so oppressed. They're not allowed any rights and blah, blah, blah. So I want to mention that, yes, we are oppressed only when it serves them. <laughs> and the cognitive dissonance of like, I'll start with like just the the, the dissonance of, of watching when I was in grade four in my class, watching 9-11 broadcasts on TV for all of us to watch. And I remember vividly teachers weeping and, and, and principals weeping. And of course it was tragic, right? And I remember even at that young of an age as a Syrian kid in Canada, who was very aware of, of the, what's going on in Syria, what's going on in Iraq and Iran and like every, you know, everywhere else that this stuff was happening in my country and in my, with my people and amongst, you know, the Middle East and, and everywhere, this stuff was happening all the time. I remember being confused about that. Why are we watching this? We've never watched any one of them before. And if we ever watched any one of them before, we watched it as like, look what we did in payback to whatever accusation they made about whatever population they were targeting at the time that they wished to 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 harm. So it's a cognitive dissonance of like, okay, this matters, but that doesn't matter. So now I have to care about this. And I can't care about what happened. You know, the the 9 11s that happened every other day in, in, to my country. Yeah, then there's the, the cognitive dissonance of the way that Arab... Uh, Arab men are framed and Arab women are framed. So growing up, like I never, I never, I always heard it, but I never saw this narrative of like men being these perpetrators of all of this terroristic activity and women being so, so subdued, present. I'm laughing because like I think about all the women in my family and I'm like, what are you talking about? Like there's nothing, nothing about this narrative that exists in my world amongst my whole community. Like every woman that my mom is friends with, all of my friends that are, you know, Arab and Muslim, like, who are you talking about? Because you're not talking to us. Like, so the cognitive dissonance of carrying all of this stuff that they say about us and then seeing who we are and being like, what is going on? This is not, these don't match up. This doesn't make any sense. But now they're in a world where I'm scrolling on social media and I'm seeing people's videos and I'm seeing their reactions to my videos and then being like, oh my gosh, I, I believed it too. Like, I believe that Arab and Muslim women were just some sort of uniquely very oppressed women. <laughs> just like, as if like, you know, the patriarchy doesn't exist everywhere in the world, including here at home in Canada. And that men were these like, these horrible terrorists. Like, they're like, we believed it. And we see that this is not true. We see this is not the case. We see that this makes zero sense. And that this narrative had to be constructed so that there could be this, you know, this consent to murder us and to attack us and to annihilate us and then and then blame us for it. So I I have to I have to mention like the silver line, right? There there I've always grown up with this cognitive dissonance of hearing about my people through the media and our politicians and then seeing my people being like this isn't us. And now it's all people are, are seeing it. They're seeing it from us, like from our our posts and our activity and our, you know, just who we are, just showing who we are. And they're like, oh wait, they want to. They belong to. Um, it really is refreshing yeah. and it feels validating when you are seeing social media and the whole entire world waking up to saying, okay, hey, you know, Palestinian arrows are not necessarily that. The, the people that we thought were the terrorists are not necessarily the terrorists. And it is validating. At the same time, we are. there is this World campaign worldwide by our politicians for gaslighting. Yeah. I don't think we've ever seen gas, like the concept of gas light or gas lit. I don't know, though, yeah. to be on that scale. Yeah. And so it's it's very interesting because what you just uh, are talking about right now is that a lot of people, the, the way they've responded uh, with the atrocities in Gaza is they're starting to um, make sense. And for those who don't know what cognitive dissonance is, and 
you're probably going to be much better at defining it than I am. But it's really when you have two conflicting ideas and you're trying to make sense of what those two conflicting ideas. So, yeah. for example, you know, someone is bad and then, but you see someone tells you someone is bad, like they're always really good to you, for example. And like, how do you then make it make sense? Which, yeah, well, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Like on a larger mm-hmm. or global systemic scale, yeah, it is, it's, a little bit deeper as as in it also speaks to your identity okay. like the cognitive dissonance exists about yourself yeah like even just the idea of thinking like do you am it's like am i actually what they say am i actually like this this you know i guess maybe i should say in my case i was always told like oh wow you're so lucky like you you made it out right you you made it from your group of people like look at you you made it and i'm like am i the actually the only one am i somehow lucky to be where I am today, am I somehow an anomaly? I'm different than my people. And I think what that serves to do is disconnect me from my people and even further alienate me and and um, push me away from my culture and hate my culture. So the, the cognitive dissonance is like, it's it makes you question yourself and then I feel like it makes it leads you to dislike yourself and dislike parts of yourself and your own identity and your own community. And I definitely went through that when I was younger, 100%. And now I'm the opposite. Like, <laughs> And now the whole world is going through that. They're trying to, trying to make sense of it. Yeah. But thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And again, I wanted to talk, talk a little bit more about that gaslighting. Yeah. Because we're seeing it. We're seeing it. Like, we see people dying. We, I don't think you can ever justify the killing of instant children. You cannot justify it at all. And yet, you see our politicians will be very careful with the letters they use. They will not condemn Israel. They will not say this is a genocide. And they will start associating our protests as, let's say, pro-terrorist protests. Yeah. And this level of gaslighting, and even just, I just want to go into talking about even like the phrase from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. I don't think I've ever seen like a bigger campaign of like lying to people than saying that that is a genocidal term because think of if you're saying from river to the sea and take Palestine and some any other group will be free, will it be problematic? From river to the sea, women will be free. Will this be problematic? From river to the sea, you know, uh, LGBTQ community will be free. Will this be problematic? From river to the sea, X will be free. And now you have Elon Musk with uh, with X. You have anyone who's posting. On social media, free Palestine from river to the sea. Palestine will be free. They're getting reprimanded. They're in the workplace as well. Yeah, and I think this is now a great time to talk about the culture of fear. So we're talking about you working at Gaslit, and now there's also now a culture of fear of being reprimanded. My question to you is, what advice would you give to someone who is seeing all of this right now trying to make sense of the world but they are now scared to even act or advocate on social media because they're not sure what's going to happen if they do they don't know if they're going to lose their jobs yeah yeah it's a very real fear i hold that fear currently i hold that fear all the time um it doesn't stop me from from posting or vocalizing how i feel but i i i've said this before and i'm always aware that i could get an email that just says you're not welcome in hospitals and you're not welcome at on campus until further notice. And I'm, that's an outstanding. And I have no explanation. I have no, uh, I have no due process. I can't even fight for myself. I just have to wait for them to give me an opportunity to advocate for myself. It could be months. Like uh, that could happen at any moment. It's happened to my colleagues. So the fear is always there. And like even just discussing like the, the the discrepancy between like what terminology is used about you know Palestinians and about um, uh, Palestinian liberation, even the fact that this event on October seventh, this 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 horrible thing that happened on October seventh, that this was emailed from every institution, every business, every single person, every politician, everybody, but the subsequent October seventh that happens every single day since have 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 received zero acknowledgement. Like there has been a massacre every day since for the last 100 and what were we at 12 days every single day 
And there haven't there hasn't been word others from medical schools, from institutions, from hospitals. I speak as a like as a physician. That's my kind of my goal. But they spoke out on hundred percent. So that that dissonance of like who like who's a human who's worthy of your advocacy of your of your emailing of your of your anger right of your support and who isn't you've made a clear distinction of who isn't so if I spoke up or if I even uttered that I'm struggling I'm grieving I'm whatever like whatever the you know whatever it is that I'm struggling with even that isn't welcomed because I'm not allowed to grieve I'm not allowed to be sad I'm not allowed to be mad because the institutions don't see that as valid. You're only allowed to be mad for certain people. You're only allowed to be upset about certain losses, not not Palestinian losses. And the similar thing you notice in Ukraine, right? Like this was something so openly discussed. They talked about it at my job. They emailed about it at work. There was support groups. And if you need keep saying, and we got you, and this, this, that. Again, not a word uttering about Palestine for the last 75 years, but also the last 100 days. So it makes you realize that you don't care if I'm breathing, you don't care if I'm struggling, and you don't care if I'm sad or upset or, or having difficulty coping. So I'm not going to come to you for it. And you're going to reprimand me if I share that elsewhere, if I go elsewhere with that grief, if I go on social media with that grief, if I go to protest, if I advocate in other ways, you're going to punish me for that? Like, that's where we're at right now, that I can't even, I can't steal what I'm stealing, and I can't advocate for what I want to advocate. It's self-defeat. It's honestly self defeating like, I don't know. And, and I feel like a lot of people share that sentiment and the, the feelings are are elsewhere in the world because we are seeing atrocities happen and we're just, our lives are not treated in equal consideration. And what happens with a lot of the employees is they feel stuck. They feel like, okay, what can I do? And some of them will call and uh, and maybe you could join a group and be like, let's send a letter to, let's say, the president. But even then, the emails and the correspondence I've seen, it's always, if Gaza is mentioned, it's treated as a footnote. Yes. Gaza is only treated as a footnote. It's like, let's, you know, pray for it, yada, 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 and then end Gaza. And so it does, it does show where we're at in the world. It does show where we're at. When we're talking about diversity and inclusivity in the workplace, because if you really do believe in equity and diversity and inclusivity, this needs to be at the forefront. There's a lot of people who either are Palestinian, Arab, they might be Muslim, they might have loved ones or care about people in that region or from that region. And if you are creating a safe environment for one group at the expense of another, where are we at the workplace? Where are we in our equity, diversity, and inclusivity? That's exactly it. That last part, that they are explicitly creating safety in the workplace for only some. And I would, I would suggest that it is incredibly unsafe to not even acknowledge, like for example, a hospital or a healthcare institution or a medical school, nursing school, to not even acknowledge the war on healthcare workers in Gaza. That is so like that speaks of volumes. And then the fact that you would go to your job and nobody even talks about it. So just imagining that you're like, you leave your job and you're scrolling on your phone. It's all these atrocities, these horrible things committed against Palestinians and against people in, in Gaza. And then you, you talk to your friends and that's all you're talking about with your friends. You're going to the protests, you're advocating or, you know, joining events or whatever it is. It's, it's your, it's your world there. And then you go to your job for however many hours a day and no one cares. That is like, it's, it's a mind game. Mm. Like you're in two different worlds. That is a, even a type of cognitive dissonance because you're just like, how are you all okay? I'm barely making it through every day. I'm barely floating, like yeah. just above water, breathing every single day. Um, and then I go home and I'm scrolling. Like, I wonder, do, do you see what I see? Like, does it come on your phone? Has it ever been on your FYP before? Like, I know you all have TikTok. You scroll on it at work. I'm sure you've seen it. Like, I don't, it's such, it's such a mind game. It is a mind game. It is 100% a mind yeah. game because you are in pain. You're hurting. And yeah. your work environment, you're there for half of the day. And you're not, you don't have that safe space. And maybe your colleagues might not mention it. Some might do. And yo, shout out to any colleague who is acknowledging and validating and creating the safe space mm -hmm. and doing what HR and a lot of these workplaces and their executive teams have not. So if you're listening, 
Thank you. Um, but for anyone who is listening, I want to just highlight a couple of things. If your workplace is, you, you do not feel safe in your workplace, one, you know, like uh, Dr. Nahla has mentioned, seek support. But two, I do think this, there's something to be mentioned to escalating matters to human resources if you feel safe. But also speak to a lawyer as well, because some of these things could be in the grounds of discrimination. So speak to a lawyer and let's go from there. Yeah. All right. Okay. If, if you want, I could also mention that like we, we have uh, for medical students and for residents and physicians, we do have like a, a whole entire group of individuals that if you are like suspended or reprimanded or have any consequences about, you know, your stance on Palestine, there are lawyers that are actually like for that reason, currently helping and advising people and supporting them in, in um, I guess, you know, going back to work. Or things like that. So, like, yeah. lawyers are even involved in our processes of, like, protecting Good. us. So, the residents and the students who were suspended, we had, like, a whole team of lawyers that were involved and really helpful. Good, good. Yeah. So, for any lawyers who are listening, this is their opportunity to help yeah. as many people as you can. Um, this is how, honestly speaking, I feel like it's it's a beautiful thing to see our community. And when I say the word community is anyone who is really being impacted by this is coming together yeah. working together working on you know using their strengths or using their expertise to elevate and push for the cause yeah and uh i also find it very interesting is that this is before this used to be like i'm palestinian so i grew up knowing that this is you know palestinian cause and then as i got older i'm like oh a lot of arabs they see this as our cause and then i got a little older i'm like oh okay i see other communities like you know, people from Pakistan or other Muslim countries, they're like, oh, this is this is not just a Palestinian cause. It's not just an Arab cause. This could be a Muslim cause. And now, today, I see this as a world cause. And it's, yeah. and it's really interesting to see because uh, what the people of the world are seeing is you're seeing colonizer Israel and people who are being colonized, Palestine. Palestine. Mm -hmm. And if you come from a country or if your family comes from a country that was colonized whether from the uk or whether from france long or list. otherwise it's a very long, long list. list you may relate you're likely to relate you're likely to relate to the language of dehumanization yeah. you're likely to relate to the systematic barriers and the injustice mm -hmm. and so when we say free palestine it really is interlinked with, interlinked with all these different types of impressions. Yep. It's free Palestine, free Congo, free Sudan. Yep. It's all together. And I mentioned the dehumanization. And I want to go and talk a, a little bit more about dehumanizing and how that impacts us mm -hmm. hearing that language, seeing that in, in the news and in the media. How does dehumanizing language impact us? First and, and foremost, um, it impacts us very directly in terms of literally being harmed. So mm -hmm. the increase in people being stabbed and shot, as we all know, you know, six-year-old Wazir in, 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 um, in Chicago stabbed 26 times. A, a child, like a baby, six years old, Palestinian. Um, and then the, you know, many other stories of individuals wearing a kufiyah who were, you know, um, shot like it's very, it's very literal. The impact is literal. The dehumanizing language that is uh, absorbed and consumed by the gl like global community leads them to have certain thoughts and certain even free range mm. of things. Mm -hmm. So it's, it leads to this idea of like, oh, well, I can do whatever I want. They're not mm. equal to me. They're, be they're beneath me. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I can, I can just do it. I can do whatever I want. So it gives people sort of this power and this leverage um, against certain individuals. And then like kind of more globally, there's always an element of dehumanization and colonization. You have to dehumanize the indigenous population for you to be able to do what you do to them, mm -hmm. to colonize them, to feel okay with it, to sleep at night with it. You have to believe that they're not human, that they're not equal. And that happened to, to Jewish people in the Holocaust. That happens to black people. I say that currently because it's happening right now. It's not a past thing. It's a current thing. Um, and it happens to Arabs and, and the Middle East as well. So any sort of colonized nation, 
and then dehumanizing language to us. So I think I'm going to speak for us in the diaspora, individuals reading it here, because we have the privilege of safety. I am not, I mean, there is an element of risk, right, for individuals who are visibly people of color, mm -hmm. who are visibly Muslim, et cetera. But there is an element of safety that I have enough in my life. I can eat. I have, you know, roof over my head. I have, you know, all of these things, financial security, that what impacts me the most is what I read and it's what I'm hearing. So it's my politicians that are describing every Palestinian as a terrorist, every Palestinian as somehow complicit in terrorism. Like, does that include the child in the car that was trapped for 10 days or 12 days that died? Like, who are you talking about? Um, and the dehumanization of, 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 um, of our men, like of the way they talk about our men. So what that impact is, um, it, it's, it's probably different in a lot of people, but I think it does lead to a sense of worthlessness, like a sense of feeling that you're not worthy, even feeling like you need to be grateful for where you are. Um, even this feeling of like, you know, we talk about, you know, when you're in a workplace, right. And you feel like you don't belong or mm -hmm. that imposter syndrome, which I hate. I really don't even agree with that term anymore. I used to use it. But I don't even agree with it. Cause I feel like it was created for people of color and immigrants, um, to make us grateful for our jobs. But, um, even that sense of imposter syndrome makes you feel like, oh man, like maybe it could be worse. <laughs> like I could be, you know, I could be looked at in that way or, it just maybe it's a sense of like you degrading yourself even mm -hmm. when you read that type of language, degrading yourself in that I have to be so thankful to be here. I have to be so thankful to have this job or to get that degree or do this thing or be in the company of these people. Or, and I think that's ridiculous. Like we're equally worthy of every single thing that we have in this world. We're equally worthy of being in this country. We're equally worthy of, 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 of everything that we have but we're made to feel grateful for everything and made to be fearful of what it could be like if we didn't have these things. So we're always in a state of like, oh, I don't want to lose what I have. Oh, I have to be grateful. And it's ridiculous. Um, and then there's dehumanizing language. I think that, you know, there was this whole article done by um, uh, Dr. Rania Awad in, uh, in California, and it was about dehumanizing language about Muslims specifically and the mental health impacts of that. And th that was massive. Like it, it's, it's such an impact on your sense of self, sense of self-worth, your self-esteem, um, and that directly impacts your function and your ability to live in a world around you. Mm -hmm. So it's it makes you more fearful, hypervigilant, even if there's no real like fearful thing that's happening to you, but you become so hypervigilant and afraid. Um, but yeah, there's so much more to be said about that that I don't know. <laughs> so no, you, you said enough. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing. I think when it comes to dehumanizing language, like you said, there is real impact. Like it's, there is real impact on what governments can do. That's number one. And we need to really establish that because as humans, we're not gonna, we're not wired to, you know, kill one another. But if you dehumanize one group yep. and make them subhuman, that becomes a moral exclusion. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's literally a, it's part of the genocide, like the steps in genocide is you have to Absolutely. dehumanize the. Absolutely. Population. When the Holocaust, dehumanizing language happened, yeah. Jews were referred to as rats. Yeah. When indigenous, there were savages. Yeah. Uh, Serbians called Bosnians aliens. And now for Palestinians or Arabs, it's usually savages or not like, like animals. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And, um, I find it very interesting, the fact that you mentioned, even as diaspora, when we're hearing this dehumanizing language, we're now, there is a part of us that may feel this amount, amount of gratitude just by having the privilege or where we're at in our career, just by being here and not there versus like in this world, we should all feel safe. Like when we're talking about human rights and we're talking about the declaration of human rights it's supposed to be human rights are supposed to be for everyone yeah right why are palestinians or certain groups in the world excluded from that it's even nauseating hearing you say that because i get like a visceral reaction like i hate i hate that we always have to be so acutely aware that oh it could be worse if we were in syria i could be getting bombed right now or i would have to pay 30 dollars for a bag of rice in syria right now or in in palestine i would be cooking literally grain for for pigeons um, to eat right now like i hate that we are so 
hyper aware mm. of the other and toggling this like okay but you know I should be so grateful because it could be like I hate that it makes me so nauseous I hate it and I wish that we never had to be aware of that we never had to even even that reality to never exist um we'd all be so much better off mentally <laughs> like it would it would change our whole mental well-being we will have uh white privilege <laughs> truly no, right? no but facts we would they're yeah. never they're, they they never have to face that dichotomy absolutely absolutely um it's interesting you mentioned that because i do think obviously the way i see it and maybe this is just my mindset mm -hmm. is that with all the struggle and even when it comes to like the mental gymnastics of trying to make sense of the world i do feel like it does provide us with a sense of character and resilience and i am grateful for that part like i know if i didn't have my struggles and if i didn't see the world the way i saw it from coming from a background that was oppressed and that was under occupation and that did face colonialism i might have a different worldview and because i i come from that background i feel like i'm i can be more compassionate and i can feel that empathy and i feel like if when we look at it from that lens and just focus on like okay now you have that privilege you have that empathy maybe we can do something to help mm -hmm. but what i find so disheartening is when i see a lot of people who are in that privileged uh, space but then they're just going to ignore it and they're just going to be like okay no i'm going to still do my own thing um and just just as a example like when it comes to boycotting i think boycotting has become such a it's such a powerful tool for resistance like why should companies profit from human rights violations but we still see people even within our community that will still go to starbucks now i think the the question comes to right now you are seeing let's say your friends do this it's impacting you what advice would you give to someone who is trying to make sense of this and is feeling this rage feeling this betrayal but what can they do i mean obviously if you have the capacity talk to your friend right mm -hmm. if you have the capacity to sit down and have a conversation with them talk to them inform them of it mm -hmm. if we're going to assume that they don't know then yeah then talk yeah. to them but if they already know if they're already very informed and they're choosing to do you know xyz action that is you know clearly against the support of palestinians then i think it's it's a very like personal decision like a lot of people will cut off friends i have so many friends i have so many dms that are just like i can't even talk to this friend anymore i can't be in this space anymore i can't go to these places anymore because i can't i'm not safe like these are folks that are like every single day intentionally making decisions that are harming me and my people. Mm -hmm, Some mm -hmm. people just cut them off. Um, a lot of people just follow their favorite influencer because they're no longer their favorite influencer if they are they don't give a, a, a crap about a genocide. Like they're no longer mm -hmm. their favorite. I, can't, I don't want to engage and they don't want to engage with somebody or support somebody that is, is um, disregarding it all and just not, not caring. Um, and even if they verbally say they care, their actions show otherwise, their content shows otherwise, like that is huge. It's not just saying you care, it's showing that you care. So I think it's different per, per person. If you don't have the capacity to talk to people, I think, you know, some people, sometimes it's distance and just separation from that person or um, muting, <laughs> muting that person. Muting yeah. is in a very, I, I love that feature on social media, mute. If, you don't want that trigger. You don't want that perpetual trigger in your yeah. life every day. So yeah, I get a lot of people telling me that I just muted my friends or just distance myself from a lot of friends. And it can be isolating, but I hope that in response to that, you make new community, make new connections and feel that sense of community and connection with people that are like in your, in your circle that yeah. are advocating as well. Absolutely. I feel like uh, what you're echoing is really either putting boundaries or really dropping your friends, right? If you really cannot align with those values or you feel like they're adding stress, yeah. you know, we're adults. Friends are there sometimes for seasons and yeah. it's maybe this is a time where let's not give that friend group or these friends energy and find new friends where you do align or where you do feel safe or where you do feel like you have common values. I liked how you also mentioned the, you know, the ability on social media, you can unfollow, you can mute. 
I always find it as a as a pet peeve of mine is like when it comes to influencers, there's a million influencers out there. Not everyone is gonna be your cup of tea, but as opposed to let's say going on and rants about this person who didn't say this and that, just unfollow them and give your love and attention to the people who are doing this, who are advocating. And when it comes to people who are posting things that are maybe a little insensitive, just mute them, right? Or, or don't or support them. them. Yeah, or, don't support yeah. them anymore. If, if, it, if it's not someone that you that you want to support, you have the choice and the power to not use their yeah. influencer codes and not like their videos and not give them views. Like that is direct support for their yeah. page. And I'm saying this as somebody who's created content like yeah. in collaboration with businesses. And, you know, I wouldn't classify myself as an influencer. I don't think I really am. I don't work with any businesses currently, but like if I, you know, when I did in the past, I, I, I know very, I'm very familiar with what that looks like. I know that you need to reach certain view counts and like counts and um, you have contracts for these things. So don't support them. You have the power to not support the people that are, that are insensitive to yeah. a genocide. And just on that, and I want, and it's a point I mentioned earlier, give that support to the people yes. who are advocating. And yes. I think this is something where a lot of people do forget is that you need to start you need to start supporting the people who are speaking up like everyone keeps talking about taylor swift hey <laughs> what if taylor swift uh, calls for a ceasefire you know we would get a ceasefire but hey we have upcoming artists we have iliana she could be the next taylor swift but you got to support her so like i'm serious it's uh, i know this sounds like it's a very like uh like lighthearted uh, topic but it's i always find it disheartening that as a community we'll always be like you know what let's let's not let's just Put all the pressure on these people, but not support the ones who are actually doing this. No, Where no. I, right? yeah, I definitely do both. Like, I, I think that there is yeah. room to pressure celebrities to yeah. to make statements about these things because I do think they are impactful. But I don't think that should be the end all and be all. Absolutely. There's so much more out there that we should that you know we should be putting our energy into. I wanted to add one thing about the friends thing. Yes. I, I know, I know, um, Micheline is like our common we all follow, we both follow commissionally maluf right oh yes the yes. the psychologist in in florida um she she posts about this all the time this idea that like if you are going to have access to me as your token arab friend right or as your token mm -hmm. whatever friend um you you owe me you, you don't have the privileges of listening to my music you don't have the privileges of eating my food of coming over to my house and being in my presence and and enjoying all of the beautiful things that come with me and my culture if you're not going to fight for me when my people are dying and being murdered yes. and I, I know she like worded it differently but like that's my that's like the common sentiment that me and her have is like if you're if if you're struggling with that concept of like oh i'm losing friends or i'm so disappointed in these people that are not talking or speaking out about what's happening to me and my people Frame it in the way that they don't have access. If they're not going to be for you when you need them, don't give them access. And I think that's empowering to see it that way. I love that. I love that perspective because you're right. Like you can't just come enjoy our music, eat our food, smoke some shisha. And these are all Arabic stereotypes, but without actually fighting for our people as well. Like you can't or have access to, or sorry, let me rephrase this. <laughs> You cannot fight for our people. Let me this part. Anthony <laughs> will be removed. Well, they should fight for our you people. Know? Why not? Yeah, but it's, I, well, the way I want to put it is that is that um, you can't just enjoy our music and our food and our culture yeah. and and then at the same time enjoy all of these things that benefit you or part of you know like quote unquote your entertainment, mm -hmm. but then dehumanize us when when it's convenient for you to just go on with your life and not care about our well-being, our people, the lives that are being lost. Yeah, exactly. It, or you just ignore it. Like, just pretend it's not happening. Yeah. Like, I just, it, I can't imagine that. How do you just ignore it? But then, like, mm. you know, you're having your balao for dessert tonight. And you're, you know, you're going to shisha, you're the shisha bar on the weekend. Mm. Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't. And I hope uh, for anyone who's listening, if you are, you know, diaspora, to know that there is a community out there. And for anyone who isn't part of the diaspora and you are uh, learning and being part of these communities, one, thank you. Thank you for, for taking that step. It really is does say a lot about, about you and your character and what you stand for. And just know that for us to be able to advocate for change, we, we do need community. We need community with care. And um, 
uh, I love how you said it. You cannot just be a token anything. We we need to start. We need to start listening to each other and really coming together for change. Now, yes. Dr. Nahla, we started this conversation talking a lot about the trauma, the trauma that people in Gaza, specifically children, face. We talked about how that manifests into adulthood. We then talked about vicarious trauma and how that also looks for people in the world, for people in the diaspora. We also talked about activism burnout Mm -hmm. and touched a little bit about survivor's guilt. And now we talked then about uh, the workplace and the fear of culture Mm -hmm. and the language of dehumanization. We also went on a side note when talked about the boycott, boycotting Starbucks, hashtag boycott Starbucks. And um, I don't think Starbucks is going to be sponsored. We don't want their sponsors anyways. Uh, but I want to just now ask you, was there a topic or something that you wish we could talk about a little bit more that we haven't had a chance to cover? I think maybe we could talk a little bit more about the survivor's guilt part. I think, mm. um, I, I don't know if I was able to kind of define sort of what that looks like, Um, especially now having a very, very, like almost jarring example of survivor's guilt, which is Martez. Like, I don't think we talked about that. that, Oh, we need to talk about this. Yeah, like that whole idea of him being a very visual, like almost tactile. You can feel the guilt. Mm. It's palpable when he's talking. (laughs) It's actually very intense. And he maybe is an extreme example because he just left a like a starved bombed besieged strip of land and and he like very kind of it's very fresh and he just left but i think a lot of what he shows us and exemplifies is what what you and i might experience right or like our friends and our family who either experienced it even a bit or experienced it through their families their loved ones um i think all of us have an element of survivor's guilt I genuinely believe there is like a a little burden that was gifted to every single person in diaspora who is not from the land they live on of survivor's guilt. Like all of us feel it to a certain extent. And what Martez exemplifies is like this, he just, his his body language. I remember watching that that interview where he was saying like, I don't have any dreams. I don't have any goals. Mm -hmm. Like, how can I have them anymore? They're gone. It's this complete like lack of future. This future, future is gone. There's... Um, there's a term for it that I'm, that I'm obviously forgetting now, but um, it's very dark. What your your line of sight, your line of vision is dark, um, and he he exemplifies it so perfectly. And then there's even the body language, the heaviness. So like his eyes are always kind of looking down, and they're very heavy. His shoulders are always very heavy. He's always kind of breathing in this like sigh of like relief, like he's breathing in, in he's speaking. Sorry, in like sighs, like. Like it's always like a deep kind of sigh when he when he expresses what he's saying, and that is like a it's like a it's labored, it's a burden. Um, so his body language screams it, and then his what he's saying screams it. So yeah. the fact that he's saying like I don't have any dreams, I don't have any goals, um, and just just so many elements of of what he's what he's saying. And I think for us, like as survivors or as children of survivors, our guilt is seeing them starving and seeing them. Um, not able to sleep, seeing them sleeping on the cold on the floor and it's rainy and wet and unbelievable. Like it's inhumane. And we go to sleep on our beds mm-hmm. and our cushions and our and our warmth. We just had dinner. We know we're going to be able to wake up tomorrow and go to work and have coffee. And mm. it's, it's so like, um, it's so not fair. You do feel a sense of injustice. Mm-hmm. Um, Montez is an excellent example. Montez, when you see him, after he's left Gaza, you're right, his body language, he says it. This, he exemplifies survivor's guilt. Yeah. And, and for us, we feel that sense of injustice and that guilt because the difference between the people in Gaza or the people, specifically the people in Gaza right now, is that our ancestors d- decided to migrate somewhere else, yeah. right? Like f- for me specifically, my, my family went from Yaffa to Gaza Stayed there for a couple of years and then went to Kuwait. Mm-hmm. So what's the difference that between between us is literally just a decision to go one direction or the other. Mm-hmm. Um, now, what advice would you give to someone who is experiencing survivor's guilt? Yeah. Um, I 
I don't think you could ever get rid of survivor's guilt. And ultimately, the same as I've, I've been saying this whole time is that the solution would be for this to end, right? Is mm. for all of this, this frankly nonsense to end. Stop the occupation. Stop occupying our lands. Stop killing our people. Stop bombing us. Um, that would be the solution to the survivor's guilt because you and them could have a, sh you know, a sort of similar lived mm -hmm. experience and opportunities and all of that stuff and life in general. Um, but I think that no matter what, it's going to be there. And I'm not saying that in like a pessimistic way of like, you're never going to be okay. I'm saying that in a way that it's like, okay, we can't, we can't remove this discrepancy. We can't remove the fact that, you know, you, you, your lives won't be equal, at least not for the foreseeable future. Um, but that, that you still, you deserve what you have and they deserve what you have. So by you having what you have, it's not that you're guilty. It's not that you're, you're the problem or your life is the problem. Mm. It's the lack of in someone else. So I would say like your, your experience, you know, you shouldn't feel guilty for eating your dinner and you shouldn't feel guilty for driving your car and sleeping in your bed and all of that stuff. It's them that should also ha have that, mm. um, that privilege. So I think framing it like all of us collectively deserve that. Um, and then also the idea that it, it do doesn't make you like complicit in any of these mm -hmm. things for you to be able to to keep yourself alive and to work and to all that stuff and, and, to, and to flourish. I think survivor's guilt is very tricky because we it sort of ties into that like cognitive dissonance and dehumanization. Like we think that we are not deserving of certain things. Mm -hmm. And I would caution of like our thinking of uh, our thinking going into like, Oh, I don't even deserve this. I don't deserve to be where I am today and have what I have today. So I would, I would kind of give the same advice about, about that. Like, mm -hmm. you know, having shared, having shared experiences, places where you can share your, yourself freely and have an open free space to talk about what you're feeling. Um, having a place where you can advocate, where you feel like you're, you're making meaning out of your experiences. Like you can make what you have meaningful. It's not just, it's not just, you know, a, a privileged life. It's a meaningful life. I, I'm going to take what I have and I'm going to, you know, pour into what I can pour into, um, to benefit others. Um, and that's massive being able to live a meaningful life. That's huge. And Dr. Gabor Mate talks about that a lot. Um, and then I think simultaneously, it's always having that support. So if you do have a sense of survivor's guilt, is having a, a person that you can go to and share those those thoughts and those very dark thoughts that you might not be able to share with other people. Um, I think a lot of the time that can go really south. So like people who have thoughts of harming themselves or ending their lives. And I would say in those situations, those are emergencies. And there's like, you need to speak to a doctor, you need to go to the hospital, you need to get, you know, emergency support. So I think survivor's guilt is just a very, it can go, it can, it can get dark really quickly. And yeah, you need support for that. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for framing it as that there is, in a way, it's there's severities of survivor's guilt. And uh, the one theme that keeps coming up from speaking about trauma and vicarious trauma and burnout and everything we talked about is really support and finding community. Um, and one thing I want to also mention, and I feel like you've echoed this as well, is acknowledging the fact that we do have privilege. And, you know, that is something I find, at least for me, is when I do feel that survivor's guilt is when I advocate and when I go to these protests, that's one way of coping, I found, at least for me, that it works. Um, so thank you very much for mentioning uh, everything that you mentioned about survivor's guilt, because it is something I feel like a lot of people who are listening are going, it's going to resonate with them. Yeah. Now, and Moataz is an excellent example. Yeah. 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 And I, I also think that, that you don't want to frame yourself as like a bad person mm -hmm. for having the privileges you have and for having, and for being a survivor or surviving, being a descendant of survivors, mm -hmm. you're not a bad person. Um, and I, I hope that that message is shared with Martez and anyone who's left left Gaza recently, because I think that is such a deep, um, deeply ingrained thought. Perhaps that like I'm so horrible, I abandoned my people, mm. and it's it's not the case, right? Like to 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 preserve yourself and to wish to survive, it's um, it's uh, it's it's very powerful. It's very brave, and it's not it's not a bad or negative mm. thing, um, especially when used 
for good, right? Especially when it's used for good. It's like our parents used it for good, right? Mm -hmm. Clearly our parents used their survivor's guilt perhaps to, you know, push us to be better people and and have these very successful lives and thrive in our world and our communities and give back. And I think that we are not bad people for surviving. It's a very innate part of us as humans. We want to survive. Mm -hmm. We don't want to die. No one, none of us want to die. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make you a bad person. Thank you for, for putting that the way you did, because you're right. It does not make you a bad person. And Motaz, if you're listening to this, uh, that you are a hero. And I think every single person uh, who at least has a soul and a heart will thank you for everything that you've done for the people in Gaza and, and for anyone who, who might feel that survivor's guilt to know that you are not a bad person. It's, it is a very heavy subject and you know this is it's been months now i can't even i can't even keep up the number 113 days or 114 days mm -hmm. and we're still thinking of the people in gaza we're still thinking of the the humans that we've we've seen and have become our friends we're thinking about bisan we're thinking about even the people who've left like apastia and motaz um it does feel very surreal because we do feel even though we've i've never met them at least you know, uh, they still feel like they're family and friends and mm -hmm. and just imagine all the lives that we didn't even have a chance to see on social media. Uh, so for anyone who is listening, just know that uh, you have a community. You have it with us, mm -hmm. uh, first and foremost. You have a community with hopefully the people around you and I encourage you, if you do not currently have it, is that there are so many, so many groups and so many places whether you're in Canada, U.S., or anywhere where you're listening to this podcast, where you will find community, where you will find that support group. Dr. Nahla, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming today and for making the time for this podcast episode. Uh, we learned a whole deal about, about coping and about trauma and how the events that started out in October have really traumatized the whole entire world. And before we conclude, I just want to give this opportunity to you to tell people where they can find you on social media because I'm sure a lot of our listeners would want to follow you and follow your journey as well. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, so primarily I, I use Instagram and TikTok now. Um, and my my handle is I'm Dr. Nahla or Dr. Nahla. Um, but I think if you, if I am going to suggest for people to follow I would suggest that you follow some Palestinians in Gaza right now. That would be more important. But I try to amplify their voice as much as yeah. possible. So, Well, thank yeah. you, Dr. Nahla. So humble of you. And we really appreciate the time that you took to, to come. And I, yeah, and echoing what you said, yo, you guys start following people in Palestine. Yeah. Amplify these voices. We need people to amplify Palestinian voices. They're... Is there not mainstream yet? Even with all of this is happening on social media, the more you, we amplify, the more we can start to see change in the world. Yes, yeah. I mean, I think they're pre we're pretty close to mainstream, but yeah, I think yeah. the more people that follow them, yeah. definitely, definitely. Well, thank you very much uh, for coming today. And guys, thank please you. do not forget to follow us on Yalala Stock. Um, and don't forget to subscribe. And if you enjoyed the contents of this episode, Please do share it with someone who it might help. And on that note, yalla bye.